October is Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month. You may have never heard much about stillbirth, but experts say it's a public health crisis. According to a report from the National Institutes of Health in 2023, stillbirth in the United States compared to other industrialized countries is unacceptably high. There is legislation to get the number of stillbirths down in the U.S. The Maternal and Child Health Stillbirth Prevention Act passed in July, and another legislative act called the Shine for Autumn Act is working its way through Congress. In the first part of Shining a Light on Stillbirth, we'll talk more about what stillbirth is and why it is not a well-known crisis. Stillbirth is when a baby dies before it is born in the second half of pregnancy at five months or more. According to Healthy Birthday Inc., more than 21,000 babies are born still every year in the United States. This is equivalent to a school bus of 65 children every day. Dr. Peter Filizoff at Marietta Memorial Hospital has been delivering babies for 20 years. He says more could be done to prevent stillbirth. I think one of the most important things we do in this office is education. And we don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but if a person didn't work in this field, there's a good chance they wouldn't know what a stillbirth was or, or even that they had risk factors for it. So trying to educate the patient, identify the risk factors and minimize them would be our goal in each and every patient. Dr. Filizoff says decreased kicking near the end of pregnancy can be a warning sign. Decreased fetal movement can occur normally towards the end of the pregnancy as a baby is getting in a position to deliver. So we ask that the mom pay attention to what we call kick counts, which is kind of self-monitoring the baby's activity level. And if she felt that the activity level was decreased beyond what she had known previously, we would ask her to come in to be monitored or to be ultrasounded. Doctors often work to balance the risk of stillbirth with other dangers, like an increased chance of being admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit or even death of the baby if it is born too early. If they have risk factors that we know could put them at risk, we want to we want to talk about that. If a patient wants to contain or carry the pregnancy past the due date, well then that does increase the risk of stillbirth too. So we talk about the risks and benefits of inducing labor prior to a stillbirth. Problems with the placenta, umbilical cord, problems with the baby, or serious medical conditions in the mother can cause stillbirth. In about one third of them, doctors do not know why the stillbirth happened. Many times when the stillbirth happens, there's no identifiable cause, and that makes it difficult for the mom and dad because it's hard to put closure without an answer. According to ProPublica, neither the Centers for Disease Control nor the National Institutes of Health have consistently promoted guidance telling those who are pregnant to be aware of their baby's movement in the womb as a way to possibly reduce their risk of stillbirth. The lack of comprehensive attention and action has contributed to a stillbirth crisis. Stillbirths are not just rare flukes that happen. Research shows as many as one in four of them may be preventable. The number of stillbirths in the U.S. is more than 10 times the number of babies that die annually due to sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS. Unlike with SIDS, federal officials have failed to launch a national campaign to reduce the number of stillbirths or adequately raise awareness about it. Other wealthy countries have put national action plans in place to prevent stillbirth through awareness, research, and care. In the next part of Shining a Light on Stillbirth, we'll meet a couple who had a stillborn son and hear from a therapist about the mental health toll it takes on the mother and her family.